This is going to be 1 Timothy chapter 3, and we're going to look at requirements for holding an office. 1 Timothy 3, 1. This is a true saying. If a man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. So first we see that it says, if a man desire the office of a bishop. So the Lord wants a man to hold an office. Number one, to hold an office, you must be a man. Not a female. Not a lesbian that acts like a man. Because I've noticed that lately how there are churches that are getting lesbians to be their pastor. But it says a man. And 1 Timothy 2.12 says, But I suffer not a woman to teach, nor to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. So no matter how much the woman may act like a man, she's still not a man. It doesn't mean men are better. There are many things women can do that men can't do. For example, the best example is a man can't have a baby, and a woman can. But for the most part, I see more good Christian women than I do men. However, their requirement is still the bishop must be a man. And it's just that nature itself tells you that a woman pastor is unnatural. It's not just the Bible, but nature itself tells you. Imagine a man sitting in the pew with his wife behind the pulpit telling telling him how to live, telling him what the Bible says. If his wife has to do this, then he wouldn't be the spiritual leader of the home. This is out of order. It makes absolutely no sense. Not only is the woman in error for having authority over her husband and the other men, but the man may be even more accountable because he would be a sorry excuse for a spiritual leader. It works both ways. Not only would the woman be wrong, but so would the men be wrong to sit under this type of unbiblical foolishness. It's foolish, and it looks so out of order. But what are some qualifications for holding an office? Let's see some more things in this chapter. And I just want to say, I do not hold an office. I don't believe I'm qualified to hold any type of office. But these studies on here certainly... <clears throat> They don't make me a pastor. I just put these on here to help people get interested in the Bible. I don't have any experience in holding an office. But I do believe the Bible. And I believe the Lord laid out the qualifications in this chapter. And they are for everyone to believe and follow. So just because someone doesn't hold an office doesn't mean they can't come to the Bible and determine what type of man should hold an office. So all you need to do to be qualified to know uh, who should hold an office is to come to 1 Timothy 3 and let the Bible tell you. And that's what I'm doing. 1 Timothy 3, 2, a bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach. So a bishop, a pastor must be blameless. So number two, not only should he be a man, but he needs good conduct. A pastor needs to be sure that no one can accuse him of not being blameless when it comes to his office. And now, men are going to spread rumors and things about a godly man, just like they did Paul. In, in Romans 3, eight, Paul talks about how he was slanderously reported. So are you abusing your office in such a way that if someone found out about it, then you would be accused of misconduct? You need to be blameless, and the Bible talks about men who are blameless. It calls Zacharias and Elizabeth blameless in Luke 1, 6. It, the Bible talks about uh, how Paul was blameless. Now, they obviously didn't keep uh, the law perfectly. They didn't keep all the commandments perfectly, but, you know, Zachariah and Elizabeth, they were still considered blameless. They kept the law and offered the prescribed sacrifice when they broke it. That was for then. And then today, you know, if you uh, are, if you mess up in sin, you confess your sin, and God is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness, as it says in 1 John 1, 9. And this is how men can walk blameless in our sinful flesh. If I mess up, <clears throat> and you're going to mess up, I confess my sin, and God's faithful and just to forgive me for my sin and cleanse me from all unrighteousness. So... The bishop must be blameless. So this knocks out a man who isn't sure if he wants to be a man. A man who is transgender is not qualified.
He needs to get his heart right with God. That is wicked and an abomination in the eyes of God. And all these churches who we hear about today who are getting transgender pastors, they have no spiritual discernment. It's a joke. So a bishop must be a man. Who knows he's a man? He must be a man, not a lesbian. And not a man who's some perverted sissy who wants to pee in the same bathroom as my three-year-old daughter. And as your 10, 11, 12-year-old daughter. That's not a man you should be under. That's a pervert. First uh, Timothy 3, 2 says, A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach. So a pastor must be the husband of one wife. So he needs to be a man. He needs to have good conduct. And number three, he can't be a ladies' man. And that's a hard thing for many pastors today. And, but many wicked women are in churches who dress immodestly, and many times they try to seduce a preacher. All throughout the Bible, you see women dressing, women messing up men, and a pastor uh, needs to stay faithful to his wife in actions and thoughts because those thoughts will lead to him disqualifying himself. And Matthew 5.28 say, says, But I say unto you that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. And if a pastor steps out on his wife and joins flesh with another woman, then he should step down. If a pastor has some weird beliefs, thinking he can be married to more than one woman at once, then you don't want that for a pastor. You don't want a polygamist as your pastor. That's a, that's a disqualification. But the famous question, the one everyone wants to know, the famous question revolves around the phrase, husband of one wife. Does it mean can a man who is divorced and remarried still be a pastor? Does it mean that a, a divorced and remarried man can't be, be a pastor? Many believe a man is still married to his first wife even after the divorce. And they believe that, you know, without exception, whether he was in the wrong or she was in the wrong or whatever that may be. However, I believe if a man is divorced for scriptural reasons, then he is free to remarry and is divorced from his first wife. And since he is scripturally divorced, if he remarried, he would still be the husband of one wife. And here are some grounds for divorce and remarriage in the Bible. I know people say that there is never a time where you can get divorced and remarried, but there is. And number one is in Matthew 5.32. It says, But I say unto you that whosoever shall put away his wife, saving for the cause of fornication, causeth her to commit adultery. And whosoever shall marry her that is divorced, committeth adultery. So there you have fornication. Jesus said it himself. Fornication is grounds for divorce. Number two, desertion. In 1 Corinthians seven fourteen through fifteen, it says, "For the unbelieving wife is sanct for the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife, and the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband. Else were your children unclean, but now are they holy. But if the unbelieving depart, let him depart. A brother or a sister is not under bondage in such cases, but God hath called us to peace. So, that verse just said, if the unbelieving depart." Let him depart. A brother or a sister is not under bondage in such cases. So, if if your husband or wife leaves you, does just deserts you, you know, you're free to remarry. You're not under bondage in such cases. And number three, of course, if a spouse dies, then you are free to remarry, and it not be a sin. So the question to ask yourself about the husband and one wife, the big question is. If a man is divorced, is he still married to his first wife? I believe when a man is divorced for scriptural reasons, he is free to remarry. And he would still be the husband of one wife. So basically, I just believe when a man is divorced from a woman, she is no longer his wife. And if he marries again, then he just has one wife. And you believe that too if you sit down and think about it. Say you work with a man who's been divorced and remarried. If someone asked you how many wives that man has, you wouldn't say two, you would say one. So if a man is divorced 
for one of those three scriptural reasons that I just gave you, then God recognized the divorce. Because, I mean, God himself gave the scriptures to show you that they are scripturally divorced and remarried. I mean, he wrote it. I didn't write it. Many say he doesn't recognize the divorce, but then why did he give people the liberty to remarry without sin if the divorce was never recognized? But the reason I have a different view on this is because most people believe a man has two living wives if he marries someone else before his first wife dies. And I just don't see that in the Bible. And then in 1 Corinthians seven twenty-seven through 28, it says, Art thou bound unto a wife? Seek not to be loosed. Art thou loosed from a wife? Seek not a wife. But and if thou marry, thou hast not sinned. And if a virgin marry, she hath not sinned. Nevertheless, such shall have trouble in their flesh, but I spare you. So, notice that word loose. Loosed. It says, Art thou bound unto a wife? Seek not to be loosed. And then it says, Art thou loosed from a wife? Seek not a wife. But, and if thou marry, thou hast not sinned. So if a man was loosed from a wife, and he remarries, he's not sinned. So I believe when a man is scripturally divorced, he is then loose, or divorced. And if he remarries, he hasn't sinned. And of course... Death of a spouse makes it okay for you to remarry. In 1 Corinthians 7, 39, The wife is bound by the law as long as her husband liveth, but if her husband be dead, she is at liberty to be married to whom she will, only in the Lord. And in Hosea chapter 2 and verse 2, this is the Lord talking. He said, Plead with your mother, plead, for she is not my wife, neither am I her husband. Let her therefore put away her whoredoms out of her sight and her adulteries from between her breasts. So God himself divorced Israel. Uh, you know, people are really hard on the divorced and remarried crowd. But many times the husband of one wife qualification is the only one looked at for a bishop. I mean, I've had people say to me personally that he would have any preacher for a pastor as long as the man is the husband of one wife and they interpret husband of one wife as only one marriage ceremony. That's how they s interpret it. If the man's had two marriage ceremonies, then they say he's not qualified. So most men teach husband of one wife means one marriage ceremony. But... They allow a man who has been remarried after the death of his spouse to hold an office, even though he's had two marriage ceremonies. But that man has just what they're against, two marriage ceremonies. But if the verse means only one marriage ceremony, as they interpret it, or on, you know, only one ring, the verse didn't give any exceptions. It didn't say the husband and one wife unless... His spouse dies. The verse didn't give any exceptions. So even the man whose wife dies would be disqualified if you take that interpretation. I don't. I don't take the interpretation that it means one marriage ceremony. And even if you do, then you you can't say that uh, unless his wife dies because it didn't give that, a, a, that exception. And... Um, and if you're just going to only if you're going to take that exception, why don't you take the other two exceptions, which is if the spouse commits fornication, he's free to remarry, if she deserts him, he's free to remarry, and if she dies, he's free to remarry. Why do you only take the one exception? But I believe, like I said, if a man is divorced scripturally, and he is free to remarry without any sin on his part. And since it was a scriptural divorce, the Lord recognizes the divorce and only sees him as the husband of one wife when he remarries. But now if a pastor is just a ladies' man and just cheats on his wife, then he's not faithful to the one wife he has. He's joined flesh with another woman. She becomes his wife physically. And 1 Corinthians 6.16 says, What, know ye not that he which is joined to an harlot is one body? For two, saith he, shall be one flesh. So you can become one flesh 
with another woman besides your wife if you step out on her and commit fornication. And that man that does that, if he's a pastor, he should step down. But now I don't really like to talk about this topic because people are just going to get upset about this belief that I have on it. So I usually don't even mention it except when it comes up in the verse-by-verse studies. And I don't have any motive for believing it the way I do other than I'm just trying to have the correct Bible interpretation. And I mean, I have so much more to lose for believing it the way I believe it because, I mean, I'm not a pastor. I'm not a deacon. I've had the same wife my entire life, my entire married life. And I've only been with one woman my entire life, the one I'm married to. And Lord willing, I don't see a divorce in my future. So I'm gaining nothing by believing the verse the way I just explained it because it's not benefiting me either way. I don't hold an office. I've not been divorced and remarried. I'm actually probably losing some friends most likely by believing it the way I believe it. But I know men who aren't divorced and remarried But since they have the same interpretation that I just gave you, they're not even allowed to preach at certain churches or on certain radio stations. This is many times the unpardonable sin among Baptists. Is uh, is they'll just do away with you if you're a divorced and remarried preacher or pastor. But the issue is so controversial that If you don't believe it the way someone else believes it, then they will break fellowship with you, even if you aren't divorced and remarried. Now, a man who is just a whoremonger or someone who just put up, just who just up and leaves his wife, obviously they shouldn't be a pastor because the Bible says in Hebrews 13, 4, marriage is honorable in all and the bed undefiled, but whoremongers and adulterers God will judge. So a man needs to be faithful to one woman and obviously not a polygamist. You know, a polygamist, he's obviously disqualified. He's not the husband of one wife. And that still applies today. Even though you don't know a polygamist, they say there's around 50,000 polygamists today. And that was common. And throughout the Bible, you see men with more than one wife. I mean, you see it over and over again. It's like this, if a man is serving God and doing the best he can, staying prayed up and confessed up, trying to lead his house and his wife the best he can, and the wife just goes berserk and leaves him, then how how is that his fault? Why should he have to step down from being a pastor? And why would marrying another woman after his wife left him so that he doesn't burn in his lust, why would that make him the husband of two wives when there were scriptural grounds for divorce? And the Lord says... Lord said himself he's loosed. Just doesn't make sense to me to say he has two living wives and then disqualify him when there was no sin on his part. Now number three, a requirement is he can't raise hell like a lost man like he used to. He can't party like it's 1999 like he used to. In verse three, it says not given to wine, no striker. Not greedy of filthy lucre, but patient, not a brawler, not covetous. So a lot of men, before they were saved, just go out and do what they call raising hell. And the only time a pastor should raise hell is when he preaches on it. But there's a lot of people going around doing what it says not to do in verse 3. But a pastor shouldn't drink wine or be a striker or a brawler, but patient. Because people may spit in your face, they may threaten you, cuss you, or slander you, but you have to be slow to anger. Proverbs 16.32 says, He that is slow to anger is better than the mighty, and he that ruleth his spirit than he that taketh a city. Proverbs 15.18, A wrathful man stirreth up strife, but he that is slow to anger appeaseth strife. So some people get so mad so fast that they will just bite someone's head off or knock it off. Especially on the road. Maybe you have road rage. If you don't go exactly, if you don't press that gas exactly as it turns green, you're going to get blowed at. But what if you get mad and blow at someone that you were trying to win to the Lord and then they see you drive by after uh, blowing your horn and flipping them off and cussing them 
And you know when you get blowed at that it drives you crazy. Sometimes you have to blow to stop a wreck, but you don't have to blow as soon as the light turns green. Give somebody a chance. Some men have a lifestyle of just drinking and fighting and cussing and fornication. And some Christians even continue in these sins after they're saved. But Paul is telling Timothy to look for faithful men who don't go out and raise hell. As they say, a pastor shouldn't be chasing wild women. Like I said, he shouldn't be a ladies' man and fighting at the drop of a hat. You hear stories about old-time preachers fighting sinners who maybe cuss them or something. That's not being a man. That's being foolish. First Timothy 3, 4 says, One that ruleth well his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity. So next, number four, train up a child in the way he should go. A pastor needs to run his house right. He shouldn't let his kids do whatever they want to do. He needs to train them up with biblical principles. He needs to teach them the word. He needs to live godly in front of them because he is their pastor too. If he is preaching one way and then doing something different at home, then he's not training them up right. Now, if a man trains them right and they still stray, It's not his fault. That doesn't mean he wasn't running his house right. But it says in verse 5, For if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? Now if his wife goes crazy and runs off and his kids refuse to act right, it doesn't necessarily mean he wasn't ruling his house right. People have free will to do what they want to do. The Lord was good to Israel, but they rebelled. Was he not ruling it right? Was he not doing what he was supposed to do? It's that they wouldn't let him rule. For a man to have his wife and children in subjection, there has to be a willing submission to a certain extent on their part. And some women and children wouldn't submit to a man if you threaten their life. And then that would be wicked for you to threaten their life. So a pastor needs to try his best to live right, try his best to be a spiritual leader of the home. But this doesn't mean being violent or hateful because there has to be a willing submission on the family's part. If if he had to hold them down to get them to do right, then they're really not submitting. They're just act, You're just doing what he says out of complete fear. But people are rebellious. And if a man has lost, if a man has a lot of kids, most likely one of them is going to go crazy eventually. 1 Timothy 3 6 says, Not a novice, lest being lifted up with pride he fall into the condemnation of the devil. So next he can't be a rookie. A novice is someone new to the faith who doesn't know much. And this type of person would make a mess of holding an office. It's natural for them to be cocky and prideful. And when he gets lifted up into pride, he falls into condemnation of the devil. Proverbs sixteen eighteen: Pride goeth before destruction, and in haughty spirit before a fall. Pride has to do with destruction, not a rainbow. Um, the rainbow has to do with God's promise. Your pride is a sin. Uh, 1 Corinthians 8, 1 through 2 says, Now as touching things offered unto idols, we know that we all have knowledge. Knowledge puffeth up, but charity edifieth. And if any man think that he knoweth anything, he knoweth nothing yet as he ought to know. So this person in their pride gets puffed up in their knowledge. They have learned some things and begin to think they are smarter than everybody else. If you think you know the Bible so good... Then look up a list of all the names that are in the Bible and give a brief summary of each person or tell which books of the Bible the people are mentioned in. You'll find out real fast that you don't know the Bible at all and definitely not as much as you thought you knew. But you do realize that there are men who have the whole New Testament memorized with parts of the Old Testament and you don't know more than everyone else. And even if you did no more than an older Christian. You still don't have the experience that the older Christian has, but pride goeth before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. A novice lifted up in pride will fall into condemnation. 
of the devil. And that's why you fall into condemnation is because of the pride. You think you're so smart, but then the Lord just lets the devil do some things to you and you find out you're no match for him without God. And then a novice, they're not going to know as much. And one of the other requirements that I didn't really go into earlier was being apt to teach. A novice is, isn't very apt to teach. He doesn't know as much. He doesn't know very much even though he thinks he does. But a pastor needs to be able to teach the Bible. He's going to have to know the Bible but because that's who's going to feed the sheep. That's who's going to feed the congregation and help them grow by hearing the word. Now, verse 7, Moreover, he must have a good report of them which are without, lest he fall into reproach and snare of the devil. So a pastor needs to have a good reputation in the sight of unbelievers in his town or city. He needs to have a good report of them which are without. Or if he is known all over the country, he should have a good report. At least don't let anyone be accusing you of evil things and it be the truth. Because people are going to say bad things about you that aren't the truth and you can't help it. But don't let it be the truth. Titus 2, 7 and 8 says, In all things showing thyself a pattern of good works, in doctrine showing uncorruptness, gravity, sincerity, sound speech that cannot be condemned, that he that is of the contrary part might be ashamed, having no evil thing to save you. So be good to people, always be kind, always hold your temper, don't give them any bad things to say about you. Now verse 8, Likewise must the deacons be grave, not double-tongued, not given to wine, not greedy of filthy lucre. So the deacons must be grave. They need to be serious-minded. You ever been around someone who just has to make a joke out of anything and everything you say, and they can't get through a conversation without constant sarcasm? Even when the person is trying to be have a serious conversation, they just keep on with the sarcasm and the jokes and everything's funny. This isn't a good quality to have in a person. So the deacons need to be grave, and they shouldn't be double-tongued. But you have a lot of deacons who are double-tongued, who will go along with the pastor to his face, and then behind his back say something else. And of course, they shouldn't be given to wine. Notice it says, not given to much wine. Now, a person may jump up and say, well, wine is okay as long as you aren't given to much wine. But compare this with other verses, like in Titus 1.7, where it says, For a bishop must be blameless as the steward of God, not self-willed, not soon angry, not given to wine, no striker, not greedy of filthy lucre. So notice here, it says not given to wine, and leaves out the word much. It's not how much you drink, it's about staying completely away from it, complete abstinence from drinking, because Proverbs 20 and verse 1 says, Wine is a mocker, strong drink is raging. And whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise. So, not all wine in the Bible is strong drink. Isaiah 65, 8 talks about how new wine is found in the cluster. So that's just grape juice. And when Jesus turned the water to wine, it was wine as in unfermented grape juice. Uh, Proverbs 3.10 talks about this kind of wine that's not strong drink. It says, So shall thy barns be filled with plenty, and thy presses shall burst out with new wine. It's not strong drink when it comes out of the presses. Any good wine in the Bible is unfermented grape juice, and the bad wine is strong drink. So no Christian should drink strong drink, and if you're looking for a good quality in a pastor or a deacon, then they don't need to drink. If you love to drink, if somebody says, well, I just love drinking, then don't drink alcohol, drink Kool-Aid, drink sweet tea, drink coffee. When I get off work, I have me a cold one. I have a cherry limeade crystal light. It quenches your thirst and it tastes good and it don't get you drunk because it's just water with drink powder. Get you some high C, get you some water. You can drink all the water you want. If you love drinking so much, just Drink something that's not alcohol. I've never tasted alcohol, but 
I've smelled it and it doesn't smell very good. I'm like, I don't understand why people just continuously want to drink it. But a good quality in a pastor or deacon is complete abstinence from wine. Now verse 9, holding the mystery of the faith in a pure conscience. So the Bible has some mysteries in it. Every person should familiarize themselves with these mysteries and with the Bible itself. I'm going to show you these mysteries. Romans 11:25 says, For I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part has happened to Israel, and to the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. So this is the mystery of the blindness of Israel. If this hadn't... Uh, if this... <clears throat> Uh, um, if this hasn't gotten a hold of you yet, you, your pastors and deacons need to know the Bible. They need to know the mysteries. Um, and if they continue to not know these mysteries, <coughs> they're going to end up sitting under a pastor who believes in things like replacement theology. Because they they don't understand that blindness in part has happened to Israel. The deacon needs to understand these mysteries. And next, the next mystery in First Corinthians fifteen fifty one through fifty two, it says, "Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible." And we shall be changed. So this is the mystery of the rapture. Specifically about an event that happens at the rapture where we get a new body. And if a deacon doesn't familiarize himself with this mystery, he could be in danger of sitting under a pastor who believes the church goes through the tribulation, which causes a lot of other doctrinal errors. How could a, a deacon hold the mystery of the faith in a pure conscience if he doesn't? know any of the mysteries if he doesn't know the bible a lot of people say well well we'll make him a deacon because they just look at one thing is he only been married one time there's so much more to it than that he needs to be a bible man he needs to know the bible ephesians 3 3 through 6 says how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery as I wrote afore in few words, whereby when you read, you may understand my knowledge and the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body, and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. And then Ephesians 5.32, this is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church these verses is talking about the mystery of the body of christ the church and if a deacon or any christian for that matter doesn't understand this doctrine he could be in danger of teaching the building is the church or that each congregation is the church or that there is no church made up of every born again believer and then in colossians 1 27 to whom god would make known what is the, what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory? This mystery has to do with the fact that the moment you get saved, Jesus Christ comes to live in you. If a man doesn't familiarize himself with this fact, then he's he's going to end up doubting his salvation. Next, uh, in Second Thessalonians 2, 7, it says, For the mystery of iniquity doth already work, only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. This mystery of iniquity is the Antichrist. If you don't familiarize yourself with this teaching, then you'll end up going along with the Antichrist spirit, which is already at work. You'll help pave the way for him through New Age teachings and like the ecumenical movement. And then 1 Timothy 3.16, And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up into glory. So this mystery has to do with the fact that Jesus is God and is one of the greatest and most necessary doctrines in the Bible. If a man doesn't believe Jesus is God, 
and never believed he was God, then he denies the gospel itself. And if he just rejects this fact that he's God, then he's not saved because he does not believe in the same Jesus that the Bible teaches. He does not believe in a Jesus that can save. He does not believe in a Jesus that would be able to take away his sins. He believes that Jesus was a man. But that's not true. Jesus is God. And the only way you can judge a man's salvation is if he simply denies the gospel or even or just says he isn't saved. But to deny that Jesus is God and truly believe that and to have never believed that, say a man never believed that Jesus was God, then he never believed the gospel. Uh, Revelation 17, 5 says, And upon her head was a name written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. So this mystery, Babylon, has to do with the Roman Catholic Church, and every Christian should be faithful in teaching against the evils and the false doctrine of this church. So these mysteries have always been known by God, but they were revealed to Paul. And a deacon can't hold the mystery of the faith in a pure conscience if he doesn't know the book, if he doesn't even know these mysteries. 1 Timothy 3.10, it says, And let these also first be proved. Then let them use the office of a deacon being found blameless. So they must first be proved. The best way to know you will have a good deacon is for them to have all of these qualities before you even made them one. It says, Let them first be proved being blameless just like the qualification for a bishop they must be blameless and then first timothy 3 11 even so must their wives be grave not slanders sober faithful in all things they need to be serious minded sober minded not just abstaining from wine but a good sound mind and not a slander a deacon's Life will know a lot of things about people in the church and it will be a temptation for her to slander them or spread their business. 1 Timothy 3.12 Let the deacons be the husbands of one wife, ruling their children and their own house as well. Once again, we see this requirement. As I said before, I believe if a man is divorced, then he's no longer married. And so if he remarried, he would only have one wife. If he has been divorced, then he is no longer married to his first wife. That's what I believe. And if the divorce was for scriptural reasons without him being the guilty party in the fornication or desertion, then he is free to remarry and it be without sin and would still be qualified to hold an office because if he remarried, he would only have one wife because he's divorced from his first wife and would not have two living wives. He would be the husband of one wife. He wouldn't be married to two women. A man who steps out on his wife or is a polygamist is obviously not qualified. If he steps out on his wife, commits adultery, then he is then one flesh with the other woman. Even though he made a vow with his wife and is married legally to his wife. And that's a wicked abomination. He should step down and get himself right with the Lord and confess his sin and get back in fellowship with the Lord. Now, 1 Timothy three thirteen and 15 says, For they that have used the office of a deacon well purchased to themselves a good degree, and great boldness in the faith which is in Christ Jesus. These things write I unto thee, hoping to come unto thee shortly, but if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how to, thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. So the house of God is made up of every born-again believer, and this is the church. A man should behave himself in the house of God, not just in a church building, but in the real house of God. The body of Christ is the pillar and ground of the truth. Not only do we make up the house of God, but our individual bodies are the housing of God because our body is the temple of the Holy Ghost as it talks about in 1 Corinthians 6, and I have Christ in me, the hope of glory. So I need to act right. I don't know what you because mean. I'm in... Six and I have... <clears throat> so I'm in the... So I'm in the body. And you need to act right because you're in the body of Christ. 
which is the house of God. And you need to act right because you have Christ in you. And your body is the housing of God, the temple of the Holy Ghost. Most of the time when people use this, they just talk about behaving yourself in church. But to take it a step further, if you think about it, you're always the temple of the Holy Ghost. Christ is in you. Now, 1 Timothy 3.16, And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up into glory. As I said, this mystery of godliness has to do with the fact that God came down in the flesh. He was manifested in the flesh. 2 Corinthians 8, 9 says, Though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor. God came down in the flesh as a baby, grew up, lived a sinless life after being virgin born. He died for sinners voluntarily, even though he was completely innocent. He was justified in the spirit because his works show that his spirit was the Holy Spirit. Even though at the same time he had a body like our flesh, and he had a man's soul and a man's spirit at the same time he was completely God with the Holy Spirit. His man's spirit is the one that went up to the Father when he said, Into your hands I commend my spirit. When he died for us on the cross, <clears throat> he was not half man and half God. He was fully God and fully man. You can explain it, but you must believe it. It's a mystery. Without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up into glory. So the fact of God being made manifest in the flesh is without controversy. There was no other way around it. 